So in our last video, we kind of mentioned that there are some cells in your lungs. They help do important things. So let's just recap. We said there were goblet cells. Goblet cells. What do your goblet cells do? Then we say they make mucus. Where? It was in your conducting zone. Absolutely right. Some other cells you should be aware of is Kolchiski cells. And Kolchiski cells are these neuroendocrine cells. Neuroendocrine. Sometimes they're referred to as enero. Chromaffin. And these neuroendocrine cells are important because they help regulate our airway tone, they help regulate our vascular tone, and this is important because we don't consciously think of our airway tone, it kind of does it on its own. It's also important because these are the cells that can mutate and turn cancerous in small cell lung cancer. Small cell lung cancer. You know that in like 12 videos on we're going to talk about lung cancer and you bet i'm going to ask you what cells are implicated in small cell lung cancer so just kind of keep it in the back of your mind next up we have the all important pneumocytes the pneumocytes what are pneumocytes these are cells that are found in your alveoli so let's just draw out our alveoli and it's broken into type 1 and type 2. type 1 cover most of your alveoli. And because it covers most of your alveoli, you can bet that they're very thin. We said that your alveoli has to be thin because it exchanges gas. So these are thin squamous, thin squamous, cover 97% of your alveoli and is used for diffusion. Let's draw them out and they kind of are thin, very, very, very thin. Now that's type one, type two, are kind of your support cells. They're kind of your support cells. They're a little bit larger. They're a bit larger, cuboidal. All right, larger, cuboidal. You should be able to tell it apart on, um, on imaging, yeah? I mean, the larger ones, type two. <laughs> it's not too bad. Uh, they're support cells because they can become stem cells. They'll proliferate in lung damage. When your lungs are damaged, you freak out and say, oh no, I gotta support my lungs. So they'll proliferate. And if your type one dies, then it will proliferate and become more type one. So is your support cells, is your stem cells very, very important? Probably the most important thing, however, is that it has these little vesicles in it called lamellar bodies, lamellar bodies. And these lamellar bodies release surfactants. The all important surfactant. Surfactant keeps your alveoli apart. Keep, keeps them open. Your alveoli are elastic, right? When you take a deep breath in, they expand. And when you take a deep breath out, they kind of close. They're kind of like a rubber band. And what happens when you release a rubber band? It snaps back. You don't want it to snap back too far. You don't want it to completely close. You don't want all your alveoli to close and you like die. <laughs> it's terrible. So yeah, surfactant, it kind of keeps it open. So it's very, very important. And before I talk about surfactant, I want to talk about our last cell. Our last cell. And that is called your clara cells. Sometimes called your club cells. And these are also support cells. They help degrade toxins. They act as a reserve cell and they also make our surfactant. Okay, so we've been beating around the bush. What's so important about surfactant? Surfactant is this protein, protein lipid compound that keep our alveoli open. And the most important part of it is this lipid called lecithin. The more lecithin you have, the better. The more lecithin you have, the more uh, apart your alveoli are, or the less likely they are to collapse. And the most important lecithin is dipalmidal phosphatidylcholine. Now, do you need to know that? Unfortunately, yes, but you just need to know it enough to be able to recognize it on answer choice, okay? So dipalmidal phosphatidylcholine. Again, be able to recognize it well enough that you can pick it out and answer choice if they say like, what's the most important compound in surfactant, blah, blah, blah. I have been asked that before. And like I said, the more less than the better. And we can usually compare it to a normal lipid in our membrane called sphingomyelin. So we use the less than sphingomyelin ratio and the more less than the better. So normally, as your lungs grow, you will make more lecithin. 
that's the fit. Your sphingomyelin will kind of stay the same or kind of decrease. So I write sphingomyelin, sphingomyelin. And the ratio we're looking for is greater than two. The greater, the better. If it's under something like 1.5, that's bad. That is bad. That means our lungs might not be um, as open as we would like. They might be collapsed. And if they're collapsed, you can't breathe. Now, what can affect this ratio? Well, you start producing surfactant pretty late in the game, about week 26 of gestation. You don't complete it until week 35, right? So you don't get a really good ratio until about week 35. And so if you're born, if you're born, born early, prematurity, then you'll have reduced surfactant. Another thing that can play a role is stress and cortisol. Cortisol being a stress hormone. When there's stress, you increase lecithin. You increase lecithin. When there's decreased stress, you decrease lecithin. Uh, so cesarean sections can cause decreased stress, decreased lecithin. There's a lot of stress that goes into being born vaginally. There's a lot of stress when the baby's being born, they're crying, they're kind of getting pushed. So there's a lot of stress in that, and that raises lecithin. In cesarean section, you reduce that stress, you reduce that lecithin. So patients or babies that are born via C-section have less lecithin, and they have uh, at risk of developing respiratory distress. So all right, respiratory distress, respiratory distress. When you don't have your lungs open as they should, you get respiratory distress, you have decreased oxygen, and you need oxygen, especially in early life, to close your patent ductus arteriosus. Do you remember that? You need it to close your PDA. And if you don't close your PDA, then you can get signed out. So let's try and jump all these factors and make it into like a step-like question. So a patient comes in, um, 34 weeks gestation and delivers a premature baby. The baby's having respiratory distress, difficulty breathing. You take a stethoscope and you hear a murmur. What type of murmur do you hear? What type of murmur do you hear in PDA? All right, so that's one way they can kind of throw it at you. How can we kind of reduce these risks while messing with gestational age is kind of difficult so we can kind of change the stress cortisol part so if a patient's coming in you know they're going to deliver early you give them you give them uh, corticos and it kind of raises the less than kind of raises that surfactant or you can give exogenous surfactant all right those are the common ways they like to test it now some more abstract ways more abstract concepts of surfactant that they like to test is that Instead of using the lecithin to sphingomyelin ratio, they might say lecithin to albumin ratio. Same thing. Instead of using that test, they might say foam stability test. And this is when you take um, amniotic fluid, you add some ethanol, and you basically shake it. If it makes foam, that is good. That means there's a lot of surfactant. If it doesn't make foam, then that's bad. That's the foam stability test. That's one way they can trick you, all right? So I've seen questions where they're talking about surfactant and you're thinking about all the things you know about surfactant and then they throw in foam stability tests and you're like, what the heck is foam stability test? Just another test for surfactant. Some other ways they can try and trick you, they might ask, okay, what are some complications? We said you can't close your PDA, PDA. You also get respiratory and metabolic acidosis. Why do you get metabolic acidosis? Well, when you can't breathe in oxygen, especially as a baby, um, you get hypoxia, you switch gears from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism. And anaerobic metabolism produces a lot of lactic acid. So that's what causes the metabolic acidosis. Another abstract way they can try and trick you is they'll say, they'll say a patient is coming in um, like a 30 or 34 weeks gestation uh, about to deliver. You want to give them something to reduce the risk of their baby developing respiratory distress. And you kind of look down and you're trying to look for corticosteroids and it isn't there. Something else you can do theoretically is thyroxine. Thyroxine, the thyroid hormone seems to increase it. We don't give that to people, but that's something that could theoretically help, okay? 
I'm gonna put this under tricks. <laughs> Ways it can trick you, okay? Uh, and then if you do have a baby that has res respiratory distress, then you can give things like uh, CPAP, you can give things like oxygen. Be careful when you give things like oxygen because oxygen is a free radical. It can cause retinal damage. So if you give supplemental oxygen, it can cause retinal damage. It can cause retinal damage so severe that you can go blind. So a premature baby respiratory distress given oxygen and now no longer tracks things with his eyes. Completely glazed over. What happened? Caused retinal damage, now the kid's blind. How do you think Stevie Wonder went blind? Yeah? Supplemental oxygen. So you have to be careful, not completely safe. Yeah, there's some, there's some drawbacks, some major, major drawbacks. So don't put people on oxygen longer than they need to. Don't put more than they need to. So use it sparingly. Now let's just kind of move on to some physio. Let's move on to some physio. Respiratory physio. So we really haven't talked about how we breathe in the first place. So we're gonna talk about physio. Let's talk about the basic basics. So you have your lungs. You have your lungs. Your trachea. And it sits on this muscle called the diaphragm. It sits on this muscle called the diaphragm. And it's this dome-shaped muscle. I got my belt here it has a, it's a prop. It's just like this. And when you contract, you strain it out. So on contraction, it, what do I want to write? Straightens, straightens. So you can track your diaphragm and now it's straight. And now that it's straight, your lungs can expand. Your lungs can expand. Your lungs can expand. And just some general, general physics, anytime you increase volume, you decrease pressure. Less pressure, less particles hitting your wall, less pressure, right? And so your pressure drops, pressure drops. And things always go from high pressure to low pressure. Things always go from high pressure to low pressure. So the high pressure of your environment will go into the low pressure of your lungs. Air will go into your lungs and you will inhale, inhale. Inspiration, inspiration. And then when your diaphragm relaxes, when your diaphragm relaxes, when your diaphragm relaxes, move back to its dome-like shape. Move back to its dome-like shape. So, all right, relax equals dome. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And it'll push against your lungs. Your lungs will shrink. And when your lungs, the volume of your lungs decrease, you have more pressure, increased pressure. And things go from high pressure to low pressure. So it'll, air will leave your lungs and go out into the environment. You will exhale, exhale. So your diaphragm is the main muscle of respiration, but it's not the only muscle. We have some accessory muscles that kind of help us breathe help us breathe all right so some muscles in inhalation are going to be your intercostals your scalenes and your sternocleidal mass when you take a deep breath don't you see your sternocleidal mass way right so all right intercostals scalene sternocleidal mass way. accessory muscles that help you exhale are going to be things like your Internal intercostals are going to be things like your abdominal muscles. When you exhale, you can you can feel that, can't you? So exhale, abdominals. These just kind of help you breathe. When you're struggling to breathe, you're going to see these muscles kind of come in play. When you're struggling to exhale, you're going to try and see these muscles come in play. Now, what drives respiration? Why do sometimes we breathe? really fast sometimes we breathe really slow well one of them is like sympathetic drive another thing is we our body measures how much oxygen and co2 is in our body that's very important if we need more oxygen we breathe faster or if we want to get rid of more co2 we breathe out that co2 all right if we want to retain it we breathe slower so our body measures those things measures co2 measures oxygen via our baroreceptors receptors all right and there are baroreceptors that are peripherally in our body there are baroreceptors in our brain we call these central baroreceptors peripherally peripherally 
we can sense both CO2 and oxygen. Centrally, something you should know, centrally, your brain mainly senses, senses CO2. That's a very, very important thing that they always like to ask for some reason. Your brain mainly senses CO2. And when it senses, changes, and says, okay, I need to maintain homeostasis, I need to breathe faster, breathe slower, it does that, all right? That is some basic physio. Those are the cells of your lungs. Hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks.